this edition of the Sports Mix on Talk Radio WRNR and TV 10. Spencer, Nick, Colin, and Dylan, happy to have you with us. We're now joined on the phone by WVVV's Eric Little. Hey, Eric, how's it going? I'm doing well. How are you guys today? We're doing well. What was on Twitter last uh, yesterday, looking at some things, saw your interview with uh, the new SSAC direct, executive director, David Price, came up, and some interesting things, tidbits come out of that interview, including uh, the biggest one is that they have several ongoing investigations about recruiting allegations due to the new transfer rule. Uh, what were some things you got out of that interview? Well, for a long time, when you have broached the topic of recruiting or transfers around the SSAC, you'd almost get a head-in-the-sand kind of approach. And then two big things happened. The first was the legislation that came this past spring that opened the door for one-time transfers. And the second was the retirement of Bernie Dolan and David Price stepping into that executive director role after Bernie's retirement. And so now you've got a new executive director at the SSAC, and you've got a rule and regulation which was not theirs. Uh, Usually the SSAC is charged with implementing rules and regulations that were either theirs or that they either created or that they had implemented uh, from the NFHS, the National Federation of High Schools. And suddenly you've got something that they did not come up with They don't necessarily – they didn't necessarily want, and now you've got somebody new in the position of enforcing that. So I don't think they're in an era now where they can really stick their head in the sand about the fact that people are transferring schools. I mean, it's some of the comments uh, and some of the quote tweets on that. Really, it's a huge surprise, a huge thing you're uncovering there. But, you know, the story is not that people are are transferring schools or have been for a while – and that uh, tampering has been going on, it's that the SSAC is talking a lot more openly about it now than they ever have before. Hey, Eric, this is Nick Verzellini. Uh, one of the interesting things that I took away from the interview that I didn't necessarily know before is that uh, with these new sanctions that they're planning to put in place, uh, anybody connected to the program, so even like a parent, uh, would be, I guess, breaking the rules how could they really prove that a parent or a kid said something to another kid, especially if, you know, AAU and travel and, and Legion baseball and all that other stuff? Well, I think it's like anything else in our uh, 21st century world. It's going to have to be screenshots of DMs, screenshots of text messages, voicemails, things like that. So uh, that's the evidence that I would imagine is going to be the smoking gun in any kind of investigation. But you're right. Um I I would venture to say that the vast majority of transfers and the vast majority of people that want to move or the kids that want to change schools and go to a different program, it's spawned out of wanting to play with kids they play travel ball with or they play AAU with. And so it's stuff like peer pressure. It's not some coach. However, there are stories that circulate about coaches that, you know, will send text messages that will slide into the DMs and, and make references to, you know, you should come over here or so, or so on and so forth. And I, I think now uh, this I, – I took the interview yes, or I took the interview this week as maybe a shot across the bow from the SSAC as if to say to some of these coaches and some of these actors, which can include the parents, which theoretically could include players on the teams, that, you know, if, if you don't get this stuff on the up and up, if you don't clean up your act a little bit, uh, we have some we have some sanctions that that may come down on some of you. Hey, hey. hey Eric, it's uh, Dylan Bishop here. So I just wanted to know, in in your opinion, uh, when this comes to the the size and scale of you know where these sort of recruiting violations, if you want to call them, uh, how like how many schools do you think we'll actually see in the end? get punished because of this? What sort of punishments do you think we're actually going to end up seeing after the talk with David Price that you had? A lot of schools that have sanctions levied against them, and that's simply because that is not our office, uh, which is which has investigation as the primary thing on their plate. Their job is the education of all the extracurricular activities in the state and the things that come with it. They're dealing with athletic directors, principals, coaches, um, yeah, referees and officials, things like that. 
So the time and the resources with which they would have to investigate are going to be somewhat limited. But I do think that acknowledging that it happens is a big step forward. And I think if some discipline happens to some of the bigger, the more prominent, or the more egregious cases, I think that's going to be enough to put a damper on some of it. And they don't have, like I said, they don't have the time, the resources, or the energy to go after every instance of recruiting, every instance of tampering, or coaches saying you're doing something inappropriate to get somebody over the program. Because if you had to be honest, who would be guilty of that? You'd probably have to say in all these transfer cases, 85 to 90 percent of the time, somebody has been guilty of something uh, along those lines. But I think uh, you, I almost liken it to a, a pickoff toss in baseball. You know, the pitcher keeps the runner honest just to let him know he's paying attention. I think you're going to see a couple of the bigger cases maybe result in some sanctions just to make sure people are paying attention and just to make sure that they stay on the up and up. I think you're going to quash a good bit of that if there are a couple of notable cases. And now the, the other half of your question as far as sanctions, uh, that is a question I asked in a follow-up email. I don't have it in the interview, but in a follow-up email I asked what kinds of things uh, could schools face. Uh, and the things that were mentioned to me were suspension of coaches, uh, loss of flex days, and I would imagine if a student athlete is involved one way or the other, um, he said uh, possible um, um, impacts on the eligibility of student athletes. So if a student is act- has been found to have acted in some kind of an untoward fashion when it comes to recruiting or being recruited. So, I- I- again, I don't know that these are um, nuclear options, but at the same time, just enough of a slap, I think, to, that if word gets around that this is going on, that, that these, uh, that this, uh, I, there, there's some bite back from the SSAC, I think that would kind of add some teeth to it and be enough to deter uh, this from becoming the wild, wild west, as it very well could be. Eric, Colin McLaughlin here. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My question, kind of a two-parter here, and it might be a quick answer, and if that is the case, then I'll move on to a third thing but my two-parter for you is uh since the entire interview hasn't been played yet and won't be for another few days was it revealed uh, for any of these investigations if they're all recent investigations coming because of this transfer rule or are any of them dating back to maybe previous years for any programs and then the second one is were any programs named specifically no one was named specifically, and I did not expect that because, again, the, the phrase he used was active investigation, and there was no implication as to a timeline on those. But the fact that the conversation was along, we were in the area of transfers and, and things like that, uh, it would lead me to believe that these are fairly recent and uh, have come about since the rules changed. So while I was listening to your interview yesterday, it kind of brought up just the fact that uh, something that Nick kind of touched on is like parents of people. If you're a parent, from what I understood was if you said, oh, you should come to to play for our team, that's still considered a way of kind of tampering or, or could be a recruiting aspect in there. How, I know from up here I've heard rumblings that someone's been turned in for recruiting a specific player during this transfer time period. Um, it could be any of those things that they use to provide a, a reason for the recruitment. Yeah, I, I think anything that, as they say in uh, in pop culture nowadays, if you can if you can show the receipts, um, that's going to be, I think, the smoking gun you'd be looking for to prove any kind of a, a recruiting case. Uh, and, and I don't know that parents or the, the crackdown might not come so hard on parents as it would on. Um, a coach, but at the same time, you know, the the way it was explained to me, you know, it's anybody that's associated with a program. And if you've got a kid that plays on the program, you're very clearly associated with the program. And so I think that's part of the way things go when you try to open things up to, um, and I guess they were trying to create some kind of a, a rule that's akin to what you see in college. Uh, to go back to the issue at large, what it was is a state legislator tacked it on 
uh, to the Hope Scholarship Bill in Mar- in um, the spring in the legislature because the Hope Scholarship Bill wasn't going to fail. So now all of a sudden uh, you've got this issue that a legislature a legislator can kind of hang his hat on, and now the SSAC has to try to figure out what to do with it. Uh, so it, it's I'll, there are some good, the, the, the good things that have come from it, and there, there are some negative ones. We've talked about a lot of the negative ones. You know, how about maybe somebody that will be buried on the bench at a big school, uh, transferring schools to a place where they get to play? Um, it's going to open up opportunities like that. And maybe not even so much play to get noticed by a college coach or anything like that, just playing because you, you'd rather spend that time in high school playing instead of sitting on a bench. So I think you're going to see things like that come of it too, where people just – uh, are able to participate uh, in ways that they wouldn't. Maybe they have some creative differences with the coach, uh, or maybe they would be buried on a bench somewhere else. But and now there's opportunity elsewhere. But you know, uh, along with that comes the the underside, the dark underside of uh, of the transfer rule. Eric, with all the schools around here, we've seen a decent amount of transfers in many different sports, and all the schools are relatively close. So. It kind of makes sense. Uh, how much have you seen an impact of new transfers in the Parkersburg area? Not a ton, but again, I think areas like yours, areas like the I-64 corridor, where you've got a lot of schools of similar size and relatively close proximity, those are the areas where this is going to have the biggest impact because, again, you know, you could, you could keep the same address, and go to about three or four different high schools. And so, you know, maybe you got a boy that's good in this sport and a girl that's good in something different, and they go to two different high schools. And you st- stuff like that. And it's, I'm sure that kind of thing probably happens. And, and so there'll be choices like that. If you want to join a program uh, that maybe plays or takes this sport a little bit more seriously than other schools in the area, it, it certainly opens up the door to that. But here we're not seeing it a ton. Uh, then the most notable case here um, was uh, Parkersburg South's Robert Shockey. Uh, he was a uh, quarterback last year for a team that was a state runner-up, and he was on the wrestling team, a state tournament wrestler, and he's going to be competing for Cabell Midland this fall. So, you know, that's uh, somebody leaving the area. Uh, but uh, in an area like this, you know, let's take Wood County, for instance. Uh, in the public school scene, you've got Parkersburg South, you've got Parkersburg High School, and then you've got Williamstown, which is a Class A powerhouse. You know, there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out, you know, will the Big Reds and the Patriots raid Williamstown, or uh, will Williamstown um, become a destination? Uh, And I don't think so much you're going to see the bigger schools in an area raid the small schools. I think it's going to be based on the quality and the caliber of a program. And like I said, a school would become attractive to a potential transfer based on what they can offer that student athlete. You know, like if football is your thing and your kid's a football player, that's going to be a lot more attractive to you than if your kid's a swimmer and they don't have a swimming program, stuff like that. You know, uh, it, I, don't, I don't see this being a big school versus a small school thing. I, I see it program versus program, opportunity versus opportunity. Uh, Eric, when it, this is kind of a two-part question here. Um, first of all, do you know anything in, in terms of the details of why Robert Shockey decided to to transfer schools? And uh, whether you do or not, the second part of my question would be, have you noticed any other transfers across the state? Obviously, you keep up with, with high school football around the state. Uh, outside of that transfer itself that has stuck out to you, from, j- just purely from an on-field perspective even, from what I have heard, uh, Shockey's transfer was based on wrestling reasons, and based for wrestling. Um, his father and uh, Luke Sammons, um, the Cabell Midland head coach, they both went to high school together. So there is some familiarity there, and I don't know how much that had to do with it, but from what I've been told, wrestling was the driver of that, as far as Shockey goes. Uh, now, transfer-wise, from... What I'm hearing, Hurricane has an influx of players on their roster from different places. They had one of the better quarterbacks in the state last year rise, or as a sophomore. it will be a rising junior. And from what I'm hearing, he's not their starting quarterback this year. They've had a transfer come in from out of state and play that position. So um, 
I think there will be there are some and another one that, that I've heard about a lot is uh, for Dobridge County received a couple of kids from or three kids from Tyler Consolidated and at least one if not more from Ritchie County and so I think you know schools that are close in proximity like that if there's one program that's stronger than, than another I think that's going to be um, I think that's going to um, kind of be a driver of some of that. Uh, if it's easy to to move about and, and maybe not even change address, but again, I think some schools will see this as a as an opportunity to be aggressive and trying to maybe build deeper rosters in certain programs. And I think that was maybe the impetus behind this move from the SSAC or or wanting to get out for that message to say, hey, you know, to, to borrow exactly from David Price. The transfer rule has changed, but the recruiting rules have not. Uh, those are still the same as they ever were and they ever have been. And they have always um, limited the involvement of coaches and people that are tied to the program. They've always limited them from being active in that pursuit. It was something that really wasn't pursued a lot before. And now in this new atmosphere with, with so much going on and transfers becoming so much more prevalent, it may be something that starts getting enforced a little tighter. Eric, uh, we've been talking to some coaches trying to get their thoughts on this transfer rule, and I believe it was Brian Thomas, the head coach of Musselman, that kind of talked to us a little bit about how everything's really trickled down from NFL to college and now to high school, and we'll probably continue to see that. So my question for you is, do you see this trickle-down effect going maybe as far as dare I say it, recruiting being allowed in high school and maybe even NIL deals? Well, NIL deals are a thing that's happening in uh, some different places. I know that, that was, um, that's that been talked about a lot at state legislator, legislature levels in other states. Um, and that wouldn't be out of the, the realm, I wouldn't think. Um, as, for rec- as for actively recruiting the hallways of another school, I, I don't know that a lot of those individuals would have the time or the ability to do that, and there's certainly not the money involved the way there is at the college level where you've got boosters and, and NIL trusts and, and things like that. You know, I, I don't see, you know, uh, what, you, you know, whatever the Muslim version of the Country Roads Trust would be, you know, maybe the Apple Cider Fund, I, I, I don't know. Just maybe it's being goofy and creative and spitballing here for you, but uh, I don't know that there'd be the time and the energy to put into something like that, but um, I, I do think people are going to maybe be a little bit more out there in terms of welcoming people into the program and uh, being willing to listen when somebody wants to move into your district. Um, but it just goes back to the idea that you know there are so many people that bemoan the fact that, uh, that the kids grow up so fast these days. Well, there are some of these regulations that when you put into place, that only accelerates that progress. You know, why don't we just let kids be kids, you know, and, and not try to put so many expectations on them and so many or, or so many burdens on them, you know, and now all of a sudden, you know, they are being approached with you should come play school or come play your ball here, or, come play for us. That's a lot to put on a 14 to 18 year old. I remember when the transfer portal came in in college, and this has always been my opinion on it. When the transfer por- portal came into play in college, there were a lot of concerns that there would be bad faith actors. You know, they'll be in the ears of 18 to 22 year olds you know, who legally are adults. But as we all know, when you're 18 to 22, you're not always the best equipped to make good decisions for your future. And now you're going to ask the same of 14 to 18 year olds. That's that's an even bigger stretch for me. And that's something that I talked about in the first episode of my high school football podcast this season. I went in depth on that topic in the first episode and the, the interview we're, we're talking about today airs in episode three. So, so in my, I see both sides of the argument on it, but like I said, I just want to see who it is that steps up for the kids here and who it is that uh, just steps back and, and lets them just be kids from time to time. We'll get you out on this one, Eric, uh, Away from this discussion here, what have you seen uh, preseason-wise from uh, both those schools up in Parkersburg? Well, for Parkersburg South, again, they're replacing a quarterback they didn't expect to replace. Um, Gage Wright um, will come in as running back. Uh, he continues to hold that down. It will be 
uh, a favorite for a lot of statewide awards. With Robert Shockey's departure uh, to Cabell Midland, Turner Garrison will step in and play quarterback uh, for the Patriots this year. So Garrison's a quarterback. Gage Wright returns as a running back. Cyrus Traw, who was the best skill player in the area by far, is at Youngstown State now. So uh, it'll be Tristan Walker leading a core of younger receivers, but they've got some athletes out from other sports. The cupboard's far from Barrett Parkersburg South. Uh, some guys moved around, some guys have matured and stepped up. So I think they'll be competitive again this year, and they got a chance to be one of the final eight teams standing this year. As for Parkersburg High, uh, they're in their second year under head coach Matt Kimes. He's a graduate of Parkersburg. Um, from the days when they were a perennial favor to go to Wheeling Island in the Super 6 in the late 90s. Uh, they were 4-6 and six last year basically by winning the games they were supposed to win, and they didn't win any of the games they weren't supposed to win. He's got a quarterback returning in David Parsons this year. There's some experience on the line. The depth is better this year than it was last year, so they have high hopes as well. And uh, it's not out of the realm to see them going 5-5, five and 6-4. Five, and four. Uh, The MSAC isn't as tough as it used to be, um, largely because you know the, the gap has widened between the haves and the have-nots in that conference. It's where maybe you're going to see the transfer rule really blow some things up in some of these conferences uh there definitely will be separation between the haves and the have-nots and so you got maybe the top three or four teams in the mountain state athletic conference that are picks to go deep into the postseason and you've got the bottom three or four teams that really are going to struggle to get to the season it didn't used to be that way but i think that's uh part of the the way things are now with this transfer rule so not out of the realm to see two playoff teams. Again, at the small school level, Williamstown's going to be a state championship favorite again, looking for their second straight. So it should be a good year for high school football in these parts. And, Eric, if somebody from around here wants to hear your full interview with David Price, how can they find that? They can find that when it airs Sunday morning on our station, V96.9. It streams at V969radio.net. And uh, if there's demand for it, I may... Archive. We don't archive our, our stuff, and uh, that's something we probably should have been doing for a while. But uh, if there's demand for it, I definitely will try to host that somewhere and uh, put that out there. But right now, uh, live stream, 8 a.m. Sunday morning, v969radio.net. All right, Eric, thanks for the time. And I would imagine we're going to be talking to you here in November when the playoffs start to ramp up. Hey, looking forward to it. Have a great season, guys. You as well. Eric Little, WVVV out in Parkersburg, the broadcaster for uh, Parkersburg South Football. Got a lot of interesting information in there, uh, more than kind of was probably in the interviews, guys. But uh, before we hit the break, uh, your thoughts on what Eric had to say? I thought didn't get, a, obviously didn't get a lot because he's, they're not going to give you specifics. Yeah, and, I mean, he doesn't work for the SSAC, so he's just kind of going off of his opinion. I mean, it's it's what you kind of expected to hear, I think, for the most part. It's what, and he brings up a lot of the concerns I think all of us have with the transfer rule. You know, I don't think we want to see recruiting in high school football. Um, you know, these are kids, and obviously there's going to be some sort of recruiting, and I don't think that any of these transfers happen without somebody saying something to somebody about, hey, you could be great at this school. Yeah, once I heard from David Price in his interview with Eric, that parents and players, you know, other teammates on on teams count as, you know, people within the span of the organization of the team or whatever, however you want to put it, and that counts as people who cannot do recruiting, then my immediate thought was, oh, that's probably happened a thousand times by this point from people that probably don't even know that they're not supposed to be doing that. Like other players and parents, I'm sure there's a good bit of them that have been talking to players about coming to schools, not even knowing that they, they weren't a part of the groups of people that weren't supposed to be doing that. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's hard to, to say somebody is recruiting. I don't know, because you could go back. Like, this is such an area here where uh, people could obviously move because there's new communities opening up in this area and they want to move to a different house. They want to live in, you know, maybe they want a newer house. Like, there's a lot of things that could happen here, and you could go back to, like, uh, if a player played with somebody in youth leagues, what if they're really good friends or somebody's family member 
uh, or, you know, not family member, but somebody in relation to them went to that high school. There's just a lot of things that are kind of unclear and that could, I guess, considered one way be recruiting, but in another way, not recruiting at all for certain certain situations. Uh, but in the Eastern Panhandle, there's so many new houses being built. Well, we want to move to a new house. We, we want to, you know, but then you move into this area. Well, you're, you're stuck going here. Well, now that this one-time transfer rule is a thing, I want to go back to the school system that I re- or the school that would have aligned to where I was originally going. Like, I mean, we're talking about new schools here. Uh, if you lived in, you know, Charlestown, but you originally, when you were growing up, everyone was going to Jefferson. Because there was no Washington High School in, you know, 2004, 5, 6, and 7. Same, same with Hedgesville and Spring Mills. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the other part of it is how do you enforce it? How do you prove that someone switched schools because they were recruited for sports whether, versus just moving or just wanting to go to the, the different school yeah, it, for it, school? It's clear that uh, this conversation has stirred up a lot in our comments section. And uh, there's definitely a lot going on in the southern end of the state more than this area, I feel like, when it comes to potential recruiting. And we just heard about it, Robert Shockey, not saying he was recruited. There's no, you know, I'm not accusing them of recruiting, but there's kind of some questions, as Eric Little mentioned, with the fact that Shockey's dad went to high school with Sam Inns. You know, there's a lot of... A lot of question marks in there, but I feel like this is right now a bigger problem in the southern end of the state than it is in this end of the state. But the, we've seen some transfers. Right. So when, you, when you hear Parkersburg South's quarterback is now Cabell Midland's quarterback, you, is, you immediately not, a flag not, goes up in your mind like, whoa, well, what's well, why? <laughs> yeah, like that's a pretty far distance. It's not like somebody from Washington High School transferring to Spring Mills. That's only a 35 minute drive. Yeah, I believe we looked it up. It's two hours. Is that what you said, Nick? Yeah, it's about a two-hour drive from Parkersburg to Ona. So, I mean. But here's the thing that if it's the case that parents, players, coaches, anybody with any direct involvement in a program can be considered recruiting, I think there's going to be a lot more than we think. That's every that single kid that's transferred caught. schools. Yeah. That's the tough thing, though. That's the key word that I said, might get caught, because as we've all said, how can you prove all of this? Right. Unless there's receipts. Yeah, and I mean, it's hard, like, and I'm not going to get into specifics on this program, but we know that there's somebody in some relation to some player that transferred to Hedgesville that was at Hedgesville last year. We know that from being there during a signing. Yep. So, I mean, it, you can question it all you want, but then there's some things that, well, maybe they just wanted to go there. I mean... Kids can make their own decisions. So, I mean, it's hard to tell if this happened. Or you got to have receipts for it to happen. So, obviously, the SSAC has ongoing investigations. Whatever that happens, they finish those investigations. I guess we'll let you know with what we find out and, you know, potentially see if we can get somebody on to just talk about that when that happens. But that'll do it for this segment of the Sports Mix brought to you in part 